Welcome back. In this session, I'd like to make a confession. I like long flights. In fact, two weeks ago, I was on a 13-hour flight from Tokyo to New York. It's amazing how much work you can get done when you have no knocks on the door, no phone calls, no emails. And I did get a fair amount of work done. I also like long flights because I get to watch movies. More movies than I usually watch in the course of an entire year. And during this flight, I actually had the singular misfortune or bad judgment to watch Batman vs. Superman. Have you seen this movie? I think it's perhaps the worst super character movie I've ever seen. In fact, it was so bad that the only way I could keep myself going was by letting my mind wander. Wander where? Look at questions I've always had that I've never known the answer to. Like, hey, does Superman need a suit? What's with that suit? And maybe that big S in the front tells other people which super character he is. But what's with that cape? The big red thing flapping around? It's not the most aerodynamic no component of his costume. Does he need it? And while I was thinking about Superman's cape, I started thinking about Schiller's cape. I warned you, my mind does wander. And for those of you not familiar with Schiller's cape, this is, of course, the variant of the P-E ratio that was, in, that was created or invented or devised by Robert Schiller, who won the Nobel Prize a few mm -hmm. years ago, to tell you whether stocks are overpriced or underpriced. And the reason I started thinking about Schiller's Cape is I've been reading an awful lot about how stocks are overpriced. And many of these people seem to use Schiller's Cape as the basis for their argument. Now, as I, uh, you know, w much of this session is going to be about Schiller's Cape, but I'd like to, I, I'll come back to Superman at the end of this, this session because I think there's another link between Superman and stocks. So let's set the table. We've had a pretty good few years with stocks, especially in the U.S. If you look at the S&P 500, it's up about 142 percent from what it was at the right after the crisis, the end of 2008. That's pretty good, right? Over an eight-year period, 142 percent return. And that's just price appreciation. With dividends, you're probably looking at 160 to 170 percent return. Not bad. In fact, stocks have done so well that the inevitable has happened. And this always happens when the market has an extended good stretch. People start to worry. And then they start to talk about bubbles. In fact, a couple of years ago, I classified the bubblers I meet, in, meet into six groups. The first I, grow, uh, I call doomsday bubblers. These people think there's a bubble all of the time. I've known some people for 25 years who warned me that stocks are too high. They're the knee-jerk bubblers. They show up only after markets have gone up for a stretch. And if you ask them, why do you think there's a bubble? Their answer is very simple. It's because stocks have gone up. They're the armchair psychiatrist bubbles, who, who basic bubblers who basically use psychological clues. Things like, hey, you know, who's investing in stocks? How much time at a cocktail party is spent talking about stocks? Small clues that tell them whether there's a bubble or not. There are the conspiratorial bubbles who always feel that there's a conspiracy against them, where a group of bankers, a group of evil rich people have got together and devised this bubble just to make them poorer. There are the righteous bubblers. These are the people who think that if you have too much fun, you need to be punished. And if stocks have been going up for a long period, you've been having too much fun as an investor and you should be punished. The, these first five groups of bubblers you can deal with pretty easily. But there's a sixth group that I think is particularly dangerous. These are what I call the rational bubblers. What they do is they use a metric that you and I use as a, it's a pretty intuitive metric of stock pricing. Mm -hmm. And they use that metric to argue that stocks are overpriced. And that's where the cape bubblers fit in. So let's go back and review what exactly the cape is. The cape is a variation of the P-E ratio. We know what the P-E ratio is, right? It's usually the price of a stock divided by the earnings. And if it's at the index level, it's the level of the index, the aggregate value of the index divided by the aggregate earnings of the companies in that index. The CAPE has, uh, puts two variants on a traditional P-E ratio. First, instead of using last year's earnings, which might be really high after a good year, really bad after a crisis, it averages earnings over the previous 10 years. The second is it adjusts for inflation over that period. It says that earnings 10 years ago can't be compared to earnings today, so that inflation adjusts those earnings. Both are very intuitive adjustments, and you can say, hey, that makes sense. In fact, what adds to the lure of the CAPE is the originator of the cap, the creator of the cap, of course, is Robert Schiller, who not only won a Nobel Prize, but actually is reputed with, uh, with calling two of the, 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 the last two big bubbles, the dot-com bubble in 2000 and the housing bubble in 2008. So if he's called those bubbles using CAPE, it must work, right? 
So I decided to take a look at the basis for the bubble story with capes. And the, and the basis for the story is very simple. If you graph out Schiller's cape over time, and this is actually a graph that goes all the way back to 1881. So Robert Schiller is actually very generous in sharing his data. So I used his cape numbers going back on a monthly basis to 1881. And this actually traces out the Cape from 1881 through August of 2016. In August of 2016, according to Robert Schiller, the Cape for the for U.S. stocks was 27.27. Hey, that's the basis for the bubble story. That number is higher than the average of the median values that have that the Cape has had historically. How much higher? It depends on how far back in time you go. If you go all the way back to 1881, the median cape is about 16. If you're at 27, you're really overpriced, right? Even if you go back only 50 years or 20 years, you still can see that the current cape is much higher than the past. Case done, right? The cape today is much higher than the median cape in historically. Stocks must be overpriced. But is that true? Is it that simple? I would argue that even within the cape story, there are holes. And here are the holes. The first is, if I just look at the last 20 years, the case for stocks being overpriced becomes much weaker, right? The median cape over the last 20 years is 25.82, not that much lower than the 27.27 you see today. So when people talk about the cape being high or low relative to history, history is very much in the eye of the beholder. So even the basic case, even if you don't look at the underlying problems, is, a, is far weaker than people admit. But I think I can make a much stronger case against CAPE. And here are the four reasons why I mistrust CAPEs. The first is, much as the intuition makes sense for what Schiller was doing with CAPE, it's not that informative. It doesn't add that much to using a traditional PE or some variant of PE. And I'll, and, and I'll give you some evidence why. The second is, the predictive power of the CAPE predictive power in terms of telling you whether stocks are going to go up or down, even though people often point to this as a strong point of the cape, mm -hmm. is much weaker than people admit. And I'll give you some backing for that as well. The third is investing is relative. So if you're not going to invest in stocks, you have to invest in something else. Without talking about what that opportunity cost looks like, it's very difficult for me to make, a, make an argument that a 27.27 CAPE is a high number or low number. I have to bring in my alternatives. And in this case, that alternative might be investing in T-bonds or T-bills. And finally, the old, the old adage, right? It's not earnings but cash flows. Let's also look at the cash flows. CAPE is based on earnings. It's accounting earnings with all its weaknesses. Maybe there's a cash flow story for stocks. So let's start with the first of those arguments against CAPE. It's not that informative. What do I mean by that? In this graph, I have four versions of PE. I took the S&P 500 and I computed a trailing PE, a normalized PE where I took the average earnings over the last 10 years, and my version of the CAPE for the S&P 500. And then I brought in Schiller's PE as well. So there are four PE ratios on this graph. Take a look at the graph. The four seem to move together most of the time, right? In fact, if you look at that box above the graph, those are the correlations across the different variants of PE ratios. And here's what they tell you. All of the different variants, from the least sophisticated, which is trailing PE, to the most sophisticated, which is Schiller PE, move together most of the time. In fact, the inflation adjustment does almost nothing for the PE. The normalization does make a difference after periods like 2008. So maybe at, 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 if, you're, if you're a defender of CAPE, you can say, hey, those years matter. But across long stretches, most of the time, traditional PE ratios give you pretty much the same signals as CAPE does. Second, it's not that predictive. And there are a couple of ways you can see this. The first is if if a, if a metric is predictive, then using it, you should be able to predict returns in the future, right? So what I've done in this table is actually look at how much predictive power there is in different measures, different metrics, in terms of what in terms of predicting what stocks will do next year and what stocks will do over the next five years. So that's what the correlations capture. So the higher that number, the more predictive a metric becomes. The highest this correlation can be is, of course, one. So let's start with the one-year returns, which is the second line from the bottom. If you look at the one-year returns, all of the metrics are incredibly noisy. In fact, the very best metric in predicting stock returns next year 
is not the Schiller PE. It's not some sophisticated measure. It's actually conventional PE, right? And the correlation there is minus 0.3185. You're saying, what's the minus doing? The higher the current PE, the lower the stock return in the next year. But when you have a cor when you have a correlation of 0.3185, you have a lot of noise, which means you're going to be wrong a substantial portion of the time. The numbers are a little stronger if I go to five-year returns. So if I know the PE today, what does it tell me about returns in the next five years? Well, across the board, the higher the PE today, the lower the returns over the next five years. And here, the Schiller PE does come out as best. So you think, there, that's my reason for using Schiller PE. But it's not that much better than using the dividend yield or price to dividend. So if it's a, if it's a, if it's a good measure, it's not that much better than less sophisticated measures. But there's a much more direct test of the timing power of the K. Let's say you decide to use K to, to, to time markets. Let me try out a very different, very simple timing rule. Let's suppose at the end of every year, you compare the CAPE, the actual CAPE, to historical numbers. And here, I'll actually put a threshold. I'll take the median PE over the last 50 years, and I'll put a premium on that because, you know, that's my threshold. So as an example, let's assume I put a 25% threshold on the median PE, which means the median PE over the last you know, 50 years is 20. A 25% threshold would put me at 25. If the actual CAPE is higher than 25, Let's say I'm going to sell stocks. How much stocks? I tried I, I tried four variants. Let's say I sell off all my stocks. I end up with a 0% invested in equity, and I put all my money in T-bills. Or I do something less extreme. I sell off 75% or 50% or 25%. So that's the column that you see across the top. The 0, the 25, the 50, and the 75 are how much timing power I give the K. And I also tried different cutoffs at 25%. So the lower this cutoff, the more I'm going to use CAPE to time markets at 10%, at 25%, and 50% cutoff. And I compared what $100 invested in 1927 would be worth in August of 2016 using CAPE timing routes and comparing it to what I'd have made if I just left the money in stocks. If I'd done nothing, if I'd taken all my money put into stocks in 1927, that money, that $100 invested at the end of 1927, would have been worth about $320,000 in August of 2016. If I use CAPE, no matter what, you know, what combination of percent investment equities and cutoff that I use, I end up with a lower value. In fact, the more I use CAPE, the more aggressively I use CAPE, the worse off I become. That's not great if you're a market timing metric. Maybe you can accuse me of being simplistic. Maybe I need to do this on a monthly basis. Maybe I need to finesse it more. I challenge you to try, th try this out with the actual data. I've had a really tough time finding a way to use CAPE to time markets to act actually make money off markets. Showing the correlation is not going to do it. As I said, the correlation over a five-year period pretty looks pretty good, but making money seems to be a quite a challenge. Which brings me to my third issue with CAPE. So let's say that the CAPE is high, 27.27. You decide to sell all your stocks. Where are you going to go now? Where are you going to put that money? Well, right now, you can put it in, if you stay in the financial market space, you can put it into bonds. And let's say you decide to put your money into T-bonds. You didn't like stocks because the CAPE was really high. The P-E ratio was really high, right? Well, T-bonds have their own version of a P-E ratio. And in fact, the P-E ratio for a T-bond, a T-bond P-E is actually very simple to compute. If your T-bond rate is 2.5%, think of what happens. You invest $100, you get $2.5 back. Your T-bond P-E is therefore 100 divided by $2.50, which is 40. So 1 divided by the T-bond rate is the T-bond P-E. So here's what I've done. From 1960 through to August of 2016, I've computed, I've taken the Schiller P-E, and I've also computed the T-bond P-E by dividing one by the T-bond rate in that month. So in August of 2016, for instance, the T-bond rate was 1.54%. Dividing it, when dividing one by 1.54% 1 gives me a T-bond P of 65. So here's what's happening. You're selling stocks because you think they're overpriced to 27.27 times earnings, right? You're buying bonds that are, tr that are being priced at 65 times earnings. That doesn't strike me as a great trade-off. In fact, the final number I've computed in this graph is a ratio of the Schiller P to the T-bond P. 
So think of this number. If this number is high, stocks are delivering a better P relative to T-bond P's, and the number is low, stocks are actually delivering a lower value, right? Or actually, uh, let me reverse that. If the P ratio for, if the, if the P for stocks is much lower than the T-bond P, the payoff to investing in stocks is much better. So the lower this number, the better off you're investing in stocks, right? I've computed this number for U.S. stocks for the last 50, 56 years. And guess what? At the end, of, in August of 2016, with the Schiller P at 27.27, I'm also getting a 0.42 ratio between the, the Schiller P and the T-bond P. Stocks actually look cheap on that metric. I'm not suggesting you run out and buy stocks. I'm not putting out a bill, bullish signal. I'm just suggesting there's a lot more murkiness behind these numbers than many CAPE advocates are willing to admit. Which brings me to my final point, which is it's not the earnings, but the cash that drives value. So here's a very simple test I ran. I went back all the way to 2000 with just the S&P 500. You see, why do you go all the way back to 60? I just didn't have the cash number data that I needed to go back further in time. So I'm not trying to be selective here to make my case stronger. In fact, I think my case would be stronger if I went back to 1960. And here's what I've compared. I've compared the Schiller P to a different multiple of the S&P 500's market cap to the cash returned each year, not just the dividend, but the dividend plus the stock buybacks. Let's focus on what's happened since 2008. You can see the basis for why people are worried with the Schiller P, right? The P has climbed from about 20 to about 27. So there's your case for, hey, stocks are overpriced. But if you look at the ratio of market cap to cash return, that number has actually stayed pretty stagnant over the last six years. So on that basis, there seems to be no worry. So if you're looking at just cash flows, the story for stocks gets a little stronger. The bottom line is, I'm not trying to be bullish here. I'm not trying to argue that stocks are cheap. But my point is, using any metric is going to get you into trouble if you're using that metric to time stocks. I don't, time, I, I don't even try to time stocks, and there's a simple reason. I've never quite succeeded. Maybe you can find a way to do it, but I don't see how a single pricing metric is going to get you there. Which brings me to the question of what's, what should I be worried about? Because at this stage you're saying, hey, are you bullish about stocks? You're not worried? Of course I'm worried about stocks. How can you invest in stocks and not be worried? It's part of the game. And there are three things that I worry about that are the equivalent of kryptonite. I promise you Superman would be back, right? Kryptonite, of course, is the one thing that can weaken Superman. So what's the market's kryptonite? What is it that can bring this market to its knees? There are three possibilities. The first is that the alternative, that T-bond that you invest in, maybe that can get a lot more attractive. And if stocks stay where they are, if bonds get more attractive, maybe you'd switch. The second is maybe there is a downfall coming with earnings. Maybe there's a, and if earnings, which have been kind of had a couple of bad years, continue to have bad years, maybe that'll bring stocks down. Or well, the third is, and we talked about this, the fact that U.S. stocks have been sustained by big cash flows, especially from buybacks, makes you worry about what will happen if those buybacks drop off. So let's take each of these concerns. Let's look at the fear and let's look at the counter to the fear. The first is on the level of interest rates. I know every six months when the Federal Open Market Committee meets, we go through this fetish of wondering what will the central banks do? Will they raise rates? Implicit here seems to be the belief that central banks are omnipotent, that they can raise rates at the drop of a hat. If you've read my posts on this, I don't believe that. But if you do believe that the Fed can actually raise the T-bond rate from 1.5% to 4% at the next Federal Open Market Committee meeting, of course you'd be scared. The reason I would suggest you should not have this much fear is, in my view, central bankers are more messengers than... And what they do is they deliver the message that's in the underlying fundamentals. The reason, in my view, that rates have been low for the last seven years is not because QE of QE1, QE2, or an overactive central banker. It's because you've had low inflation and low real growth. So if rates go up, but they go up because inflation goes up or real growth goes up, then the story about stocks becomes a lot murkier because then the earnings are also going to reflect those same fundamentals. So am I worried about interest rates going up? Yes, I'm, I'm always worried, but I'm not... Uh, I To me, that worry doesn't come from a central banker going crazy overnight, it's coming from the fundamental shifting. Second, 
there is this possibility of an earnings hangover. Like what? Like 2009. Remember how much earnings dropped off after the last crisis? There is this very real chance that earnings could drop off. And the last two years have been tough years for the S&P 500. As you can see by looking at the earnings numbers, the earnings dropped about 11% in 2015 and are on track to drop further this year. Now, in fact, if you think about all the stuff that's working against earnings in the last two years, it's actually interesting that earnings have dropped only as much as they have. Like what? Like a stronger dollar, like the China crisis, like Brexit. Those things seem to, the market's done pretty well, in my view, in dealing with those. But there is, I guess, a chance that earnings could drop off further in the future. Another crisis could come through. So that's a second worry. But again, you know, we, we've seen crises every year that people are pointed to as the crisis, and the market seems to have weathered each of them, which brings me to what I worry about the most. To me, this is the most likely kryptonite for stocks. Cash flows are high. In fact, they're too high. How do I know they're too high? In this table, I've actually computed the percentage of earnings that U.S. companies are returning in the form of dividends and buybacks. The average for that statistic is about 80% if you go back about 16 years. But in the last couple of years, 2015, in the last 12 months of 2016, you can see that that number has exceeded 100%. That's not sustainable. You cannot return more than 100% of your earnings as cash flows for extended periods. Now, that, does that mean stocks are going to go down? No, I think that cash flows are going to pull back, that the buyback number especially is going to come back to earth. Markets might have already incorporated that. In fact, you know, it's, um, it, there is some evidence that markets have incorporated it because it looks like, if you compute, I compute a number called the implied equity risk premium, that that number looks insanely high if, if I put in the trailing 12-month cash flows, but they actually look pretty close to what they should be if I normalize those cash flows. So if you have a concern, this should be it. And I would keep an eye on how much buybacks start to slacken in the next year or two because that might start to put some pressure on stocks. What's the bottom line? I think we all want to time markets, because let's face it, if you can time markets, you're gonna make a ton of money. So we're all in one guise or the other market timers, and the reality also is that there will be a market correction. Why? Because it always is. It's not because I see something in the horizon that's gonna lead me to believe the correction is imminent, but there will be a correction. We also know that when that correction happens, there'll be a lot of I told you so's, Mostly from the bubblers, people who've been telling you for the last year, last two years, last five years, last 10 years, there's a bubble. And you'd be tempted to anoint them as heroes because, hey, they call the bubble, right? But I would suggest you look at their entire track record. Because it, if all they did was keep you out of this crash, but in the process, they've also kept you out of stocks for the last 10 years, you'd pro you're probably worse off than you would have been if you'd stayed in stocks and gone through the crash. In my view, and this is just my perspective, every market crash creates these market gurus, people who claim to be market timers extraordinaire. They last about a cycle because here's what tends to happen. They become prideful. They essentially think they can time markets and then they go out of control. And once they go out of control, it's almost set up that they will not call the next market crash correctly. So... Uh, don't don't take my word for it. No, be skeptical, and take these market timers with a grain of salt. Thank you very much for listening.